Yeah, so I'm Helen. I'm the uh, nutrition lead at the Portland Centre as well as um, the Kitchen on Prescription project lead. So really delighted to be here today and uh, I'm part of the Portland Centre team. Um, and I'm squeezing two presentations into one because we were going to have the Kitchen on Prescription um, presentation and then we were going to hear from Ali Kavandi, Dr Ali Kavandi from Cardiologist Kitchen, but unfortunately he couldn't be here today. So I'm going to do a bit of a whistle-stop tour through the nutritional approaches to heart health as well um, and I've been onto his website and pinched a bit of his material but I've acknowledged him so he shouldn't be too cross. Um, so just going to give you a little overview about Kitchen on Prescription. Um, yes okay so it's all about making food a mainstream offer and you know which is again a bit if anybody came to William Bird's um, presentation last night who was talking a lot about exercise and nutrition I mean this is such a simple and yet um, neglected area and you know centuries ago Hippocrates was talking about making you know food medicine so why is it taken us all this length of time to catch up it's a little bit hard to understand but anyway we are catching up and it's really exciting and it's something that um, is getting a lot of interest so it's it's a motivational um, health eating cookery course um, for people with health conditions um, and what we're aiming to do is inspire and equip individuals um, to eat delicious food so it's not going to taste like medicine even though we're trying to um, inspire people to see their kitchen as their med medicine chest and it's all about cooking food from scratch um, to improve health and well-being and we've got a um, really broad working party comprised of doctors, dietitians, nutritional therapists um, community food educators, members of the public health team and a consultant psychologist so um, we have come together a range of part, a range of different partners um, to develop what we call the Bristol Kitchen Obscription Partnership, because Kitchen Obscription has actually been happening for some time at Wellspring Healthy Living Centre as an intervention. Um, but we were lucky enough to get some money from Bristol Green Capital this year, um, and um, to roll a Kitchen Obscription out across Bristol. So we're, we're all working together thinking strength in numbers and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. So these are the partner organisations and we're hoping that more will join in the coming year. Wellspring Healthy Living Centre have been um, working with Kitchen on Prescription for a while as I said. Um, and yeah, so a lovely range of people. And just a little bit of the background around why it's important. Um, hearing a lot about diet, which is um, really exciting. And, but yet, you know, why has it been so neglected? Powerful determinant of cardiovascular disease, um, poor diet contributing to more disease than physical, and physical inactivity, smoking and alcohol combined. And just small changes here being talked about. So increasing the portion of vegetables by one portion a day, nut consumption two portions a week, could save this amount of deaths in just a year. So, you know, why? Why isn't it, um, yeah, kind of just, yeah, getting more attention? And only three in ten adults, as we probably know, are eating this um, five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. So our mission is to kind of do something about this. A <laughs> um, little bit about obesity figures. As you can see, they're soaring. Um, actually, they're tailing off a bit, which is nice to see. But if you look back the figures 93 to 95, um, the green is men, the red is women, 14%. So these are uh, within UK and Ireland, um, how many people were obese? And that, in 20 years, has gone up by 10%. So pretty dramatic. Um, 2013, 62% of adults overweight or obese, um, and yeah, we've talked about the rise, similar amongst men and women, but this horrible statistic here that by 2050, it's predicted that 60% of adult men, 50% of adult women, and 25% of children are going to have this, um, but anyway, maybe not if kitchen prescription um, <laughs> gets going, so there we go. Um, we were hearing last night a lot from Dr. William Bird about how you know, complex the issue of obesity is. Yes, partly genetic, hormonal, lack of exercise, stress plays a real part, lack of sleep, 
interferes with the metabolism, environmental pollutants, that's getting a bit more attention. Um, interestingly, and I'm really following the, the research with this, um, the microbiome is being linked to um, obesity, and that's an absolutely fascinating subject, and um, not really time to go into that anymore, but I was really pleased to hear that you were talking about probiotics and the importance of them, and um, so lots, lots to think about there. So barriers to eating healthily. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. I mean, it's um, amazing to me at the moment. I mean, every time you um, put on the TV, there is a sort of cookery program. And, of course, we've had all the sort of bake-off thing um, recently, which is you know, that's so, so popular. Um, but why aren't people you know, in their kitchens cooking? Why are they in front of the television? <laughs> so I don't want to rant because it sounds awful. But um, there is a lack of cooking, cooking skills going on, family influences, families. It's now being passed through the generations. Families aren't cooking. There's a perceived, um, it's, it is actually a perceived um, kind of belief that um, fresh food or healthy food costs more and that actually um, is, isn't true and that's another thing we're trying to do with kitchen on prescription is teach people that this type of food doesn't have to cost more. Um, but being, a recent study has shown that being confident in the kitchen may reduce obesity um, figures and there's lots of myths, myths and misconceptions about what constitutes a healthy diet. So as we see here. Um, eat on one diet, you can eat all the steak you want, it's the bread that ki kills you, and on another diet, it's eat all the, yeah, the other way around. And then I think people get complacent. I hear this all the time, people saying, oh, yeah, but nobody can make up their mind, so I'm just going to you know, carry on and eat whatever because it'll change in another couple of years. Well, yeah, I mean, there are some basics, and we're going to talk about those a little bit today. So a little bit about um, what we're aiming to do with Kitchen on Prescription. We're going to um, offer it ideally in a sustainable, scalable way, starting with Bristol and then hopefully the UK. Economically efficient, evidence-based. Um, we're very keen to look at the evidence and make sure that we're not just teaching people how to cook, but it's something that's able to be um, something that they can uh, maintain so as a, a long-term behaviour change. We're going to be, as a team, um, developing best practice guidelines. So we're going to develop a kind of a kite mark so that doctors and healthcare professionals can be really confident that when they're recommending somebody to this, there is some sort of minimum standards that they can, they can know that we're adhering to so that we're going to have some uh, quality standards. We're um, fitting in with the social prescribing um, framework. There's a lot happening with, in Bristol within, uh, about social prescribing, which is exciting. A lot of you will have probably heard of social prescribing. So it's a, a mechanism, really, where um, doctors and healthcare professionals can um, refer people to non-medical things like exercise prescription, art on prescription, and so, hence, kitchen on prescription um, does what it says on the tin. And we're hoping this will be one way that we'll be able to get some funding. So we're busy trying to tick all the boxes to be a social prescribing intervention. Um, these are some of the um, kitchens and the partners that we're, we're linking in with across Bristol. And the aim is that we're going to have a nice interactive map and a website so that healthcare professionals can see where their nearest kitchen on prescription course is and be able to refer to it locally. People will be able to self-refer, but ideally it would be great if it was uh, um, something that they could um, get free of charge. Key components. Um, nutrition, healthy eating recommendations, so all about cooking food from scratch. Um, inspiring, really, just that you know, food, they are able to take a very active role in their own healthcare just by changing their diet. So we're trying to really um, inspire people here how to cook good <coughs> food from scratch, but the psychological, behavioural um, component is key. So psychological barriers. Um, we've got a great clinical psychologist involved, Helen McCarthy, um, because our literature, uh, recent literature uh, search that we did showed that you know, there's a lot of cooking skills interventions out there, but very few are combining this with psychological and motivational support. So we're, we're trying to do both. And the NICE guidance are saying that that's an uh, you know, essential component. So a little bit about, we ran a great um, pilot study in the Greenways Centre 
Um, the aims of this were just to look at our learning outcomes and also to gauge views of the health professionals, um, how many were going to prescribe it, how was referral going to work. And we'd also bought some um, pop-up kitchen equipment with the money that we were given for the grant and so we were just seeing how this would work using a sort of pop-up style kitchen. Um, it went really well. Um, we, th the way we're, we were uh, measuring this was through various qualitative and quantitative questionnaires. Um, midway through at the end, we used a validated outcome measure called MICOR, where um, patients um, record their own concerns, what brought them to the, the cookery course. And this is a little bit what people... Um, a little bit of the demographics. We had 13, which is what we hoped for, and we've only got the data for nine because um, a few people didn't give the full data. Um, referral was great, really encouraging. The course actually got booked up within two weeks, so um, we know that health care professionals want this, and I'm getting emails from doctors all the time across the county saying, um, when is this going to be available? When is it something that I can refer into? Um, one was self-referral. He actually worked at the Greenway Centre at the food bank on a Thursday and just was walking past and thought, oh, this looks fun, can I join in? And um, he happened to be a really lively member, so that was nice. Um, range of different healthcare um, conditions from diabetes to cancer, PCOS, um, back pain. So um, a little bit about what their hopes were for the course, being able to cook quick and easy meals, um, quick and easy seems to be the thing. Everybody's busy. Um, nobody wants to spend lots of time in the kitchen. Um, reduce sugar levels. Um, feel more confident. Learn how to cook to enjoy it. I mean, that's a really important component, and uh, you know, we were trying to make it fun. Um, manage condition by learning to cook healthy food and con to control my weight to eat more healthily. So, am I going to brave this video? Okay. <laughs> Don't you feel the times come for you to see the light? Cost of treating people who are obese or overweight or with diabetes is going through the roof. And at the same time, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in understanding the, the role that food plays in health. So within that context, we're developing Kitchen on Prescription. It's working with people that have been referred to us to actually learn to cook alongside um, having a chronic illness. Just to learn more about healthy eating and what I can and what I can't eat. And to help enable people to really manage their own health and reduce their reliance on, on the healthcare system. I just think it's really important that people are eating together, learning how to eat well for themselves their body types, their way of living. In courses that we've, we've carried out, you can really see a community develop, and they then together support each other in making the changes at home. Everything around you seems more positive, I think, than what it does if you're like going around in a daze all the time because you haven't eaten the right food. You're eating healthy enough for you to um, be more healthier and, well, technically, be more happy. You kind of take it for granted that they're just turning up and whereas in fact it's having a bigger impact and it's more of more importance to them than it is to me. If corporates are interested in getting involved and helping support the project, they can contact me directly or you can also um, check out our page on neighbourly.com. So that's a little pitch there we were doing for a, a fundraising um, thing. Great. So that gives you a little idea of some of the atmosphere, which was great actually. It was really a, a lovely buzz. Um, Okay, so a little bit of um, end of course reflection. As you um, saw from the video, one of the great things was actually the, um, the social aspect, and that came up quite a lot here. So joining in group togetherness, um, more recipes might not have tried before. Um, it's fine. Okay. Just come back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this moment of trust. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, not going to fail us. Uh, yeah. There we go. 
so yeah, the sociable um, issue came up quite a bit. Um, making cooking more fun, less of a chore, which is great. Uh, learning how to use spices, that's something we really try and do to help people sort of, in in maybe rather than um, using loads of salt and sugar, thinking about how to use spices and herbs. Um, so that, a little bit of the quantity, of, obviously these are very, very small figures, but even just in these small figures, um, their main concerns did reduce and their well-being um, improve just in that short time. Um, we're doing a little bit more um, research, which is very exciting. We are doing a feasibility study for a KOP for obesity program early in the new year. So we're going to be um, interviewing 20 families with an obese child about how they cook and eat, and also interview GPs and nurses to see what they think of the program and whether they'd be willing to prescribe it. Um, and then we're going to be doing a couple of pilots um, and then uh, using questionnaires and also a focus group at the end um, with families to see what they thought of it. And we aim to use this to further refine the program and to plan larger research study. And that's very small. Um, professor Hamilton Shield, who's a professor of diabetes and endocrinologist, and Debbie Sharp, who's a professor of primary health care, are supporting this project. So we're very excited about that. So um, we are coming on then to the um, second half, which is a little whistle stop through nutrition approaches for a healthy heart. So Dr. Ali Kavandi sadly can't be here today, um, but I really recommend you check out his um, website. It's a fantastic resource and um, amazing. He's a bath cardiologist, and he's really trying to, this is what he's aiming to do, helping people improve um, Oh, their heart health and um, through evidence-based dietary interventions. But it's a really lively website. It's got great information and lovely recipes, and it's very um, sort of patient-friendly. So um, how exciting that this is a cardiologist um, who's uh, yeah um, recommending um, healthy eating and yeah very inspiring guy. So this is his list of from damaging foods to protective foods. Um, there may be a few surprises here, and we'll go through this. The saturated fat um, is, is quite an interesting issue, but I'm going to go through some of these points individually. So um, what comes up continually when you're looking at heart health is the, bene the benefits of a Mediterranean-style diet. Um, some of you may know of the PREDIMED study, um, a huge study, thousands, um, 7,000 men and women, ranged with 55 to 88. They didn't have established ca cardiac disease, but they were at high cardiovascular risk. And the study was actually stopped um, just almost five years because there was such a clear signal of health benefit amongst um, subjects eating the, the Mediterranean diet. And the, in the olive oil in the Mediterranean group, um, yeah, you see here that uh, MI stroke cardiovascular death reduced by 30 and 28 percent respectively um, compared to the control group. So these are, you know, pretty impressive um, figures here. So we're going to take a little quick look through some of the protective um, foods, just some of the highlights really. Um, Another very recent review, just talking about this whole diet approach. So, it's you know it's not anything fatty. It's about as much important about what people are adding in as taking out. But actually, uh, far more important um, that there's this focus on vegetables, fruit, fish, whole grains, and olive oil. Um, that's that actually um, more important than a low fat, low cholesterol diet. And for some people, you know that might be. A little bit of a surprise. Other people have been following the evidence, less of a surprise. But it's the, the whole area of fats and oils is quite a controversial area, and I'm just I'm going to be talking about this. But it's a really, really interesting area. Um, but we see there that greater um, than potentially benefit than the, um, the benefit observed in statins. So these are things that people can do that also taste delicious and, um, and not expensive. They don't have to be expensive. So fruit and vegetables, we're always talking about a rainbow of colours. Um, you get all the, in, in these lovely colours, probably a lot of you know, um, the colours actually, they contain phytochemicals, and the deeper the colour, the more phytochemicals, and there's so much more I could say about that, um, but there isn't time today, but it's a really, really interesting area, especially how plants get these colours in the first place and why they do, but um, I can't go into that today. 
um, potassium, um, increased potassium, and that's um, in these vegetables. Um, very important, although obviously if people have kidney problems and um, some diabetic patients have to be a bit careful with potassium. But these are the best foods to boost potassium. Um, again, lots of lovely vegetables, um, avocados, sweet potatoes, white beans, bananas, or dried apricots. Um, I've got the list of references at the end, and if anybody wants um, this handout, then they can just contact us, and um, I'm happy to give that out. Um, beetroot, that's been getting a bit of press recently. I don't know whether, yeah, people are nodding their heads here. <laughs> So 250 mils of beetroot juice uh, reduces blood pressure by a clinically significant degree, um, as much as achieved by the single antihypertensive medication. So those, um, those of your patients who don't want to take a, 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 an antihypertensive, um, start with their beetroot juice. And you can actually buy, now buy beetroot juice in, in the little sort of plastic bottles, and it's tasty. Add a little bit of apple, and it's a really delicious um, drink. So beetroots are, and it's all thought to due to the nitrates, which have a vasodilating effect. This GP here nodding his head, hooray. Um, so there are other food sources of nitrate, which is celery, lettuce, watercress, rocket, spinach, chard, fennel, and radish. And uh, Cardiologist Kitchen website, they have various recipes for salads and things containing all these goodies. So um, yeah, really um, exciting area. Yeah, well, you um, you get you do need to get a juicer, um, and so otherwise, yeah, that that would be kind of hard. Um, but and you just literally chop them up and put it through the juicer. It takes literally minutes um, to do. I mean, I'm quite keen on vegetable um, smoothies rather than juices often because you get the fibre too. Because if you um, people have too many vegetable juices, the actual sugar, the fructose in it, can be a little bit too much for people. But to get the antihypertensive effect, yeah, beetroot just be. Yeah, the nutri bullet. Yeah, great um, <laughs> nutri bomb. <laughs> oh, that's. Um, <laughs> I haven't. Yeah, I haven't. Um, <laughs> could make a bomb. Yeah, that's great uh, because it keeps the fibre in, but yes. um, you probably have to have even more to get your really concentrated amount of beetroot. But you can make beetroot soups. There's so much you can do with beetroot, what roasting them. The yeah, well, that's even better, I think, because then you get all the goodness from the fermented. So, yeah, anything, any beetroot stuff, good. But, yeah, particularly fermented, great. Um, cocoa, so for all the chocolate addicts out there, the flavanols in them. Um, everybody's getting excited now. Is that the chocolate <laughs> being mentioned? Um, again, um, thought to um, be due to the nitrate effect, which promotes vasodilation, but cocoa and chocolate also contains lots of flavanols, which are heart healthy. Um, it's only the dark chocolate, so those of you who are the sort of milk chocolate or white chocolate lovers, it's not so great because of the sugar. Um, Phytonutrients, also good for reducing blood pressure. Um, these are all a list of phytonutrients, onions, garlic, um, oats, beta-glucans, isoflow from soya beans, polyphenols from green tea, pomegranate, olive oil. So, you know, we really do mean it when we can say that your kitchen can become your medicine chest um, because it's true and we've got the research now to back it up. A lot of the evidence is epidemiological and it's you know more associational rather than causation, but the studies are coming in um, to back some of these foods up. And anyway, most of those are really delicious and I, most of you, I think, would agree that that's not going to be um, too um, arduous to include these in our diet. So, Berries, great, all the dark pigments, especially um, cardioprotective. I popped this little study in yeah. because it was a new one. Yeah, and it's Friday night. We might all go and have to have a glass of wine. But um, what I didn't realize is that ethanol um, in alcohol can actually improve glucose metabolism. And so there's some really interesting studies around and, uh, that just popping out around that. And um, so it's not just the resveratrol in uh, red wine, which has loads of benefits. Um, but, and the phenols, but the ethanol too, but of course in moderation. They're talking about a glass of wine, so yeah, that's... Um, um, complex carbohydrates, really important. Oats and barley, reducing cholesterol. Um, protein, um, 
So partial substitution of carbohydrate. Um, so we're very much getting away from the refined carbohydrates, away from the sugars, um, some animals, some vegetable source protein, again, lowering blood pressure and improving lipid levels. Oily fish, we're going to talk a little bit more about oils um, um, shortly. Omega-3s and anti-inflammatory and nuts. And the best sources of nuts um, to be thinking about are hazelnuts and walnuts, um, again, because they have the hypertens anti-hypertensive um, effect. So oils, lots of controversy. And saturated fats, not the prime evil, though once considered. This is, oh yes, hello Duncan, fine, it's okay, right. I thought you were asking a question there. Um, so there's been a lot of press about this recently, that the low-fat guidelines from the 80s are outdated and linked. This is, I, I'm much braver making this statement because cardiologist Kitchen said it, because there's, uh, there has been quite a lot of excitement about this because anyway it's it's tricky because the government guidelines are still talking about low fat but it's the type of fat as we're going to see but the idea that this may be linked the low fat guidelines linked to the increase in cardiovascular disease um, is is something I'm going to very briefly talk about recent meta-analysis showed no link between saturated fat consumption and risk for cardiovascular disease so again, cardiologists' kitchens say clear that a low-fat diet is not healthy. Low-fat products are usually bad for you. I usually demo this, um, that you can buy those 0% fat yogurts, and they contain around three teaspoons, the little ones, three teaspoons of sugar. So, and it's really the sugar and the fat, refined carbohydrates that are going to be much worse. So this 0% fat craze is nuts, and... You know, it is increasing the amount of um, yeah, sugar that people are having, which is likely to be leading to obesity, diabetes, and chronic inflammation. So, D Dean Ornish doesn't believe this. He still believes in low fat. He did a very interesting study, but his was a whole lifestyle program, 10%, very low fat diet, very vegetarian, but did lots of all these other lovely goodies. Um, but showed not only some actual regression of coronary atherosclerosis, which is pretty unheard of, um, and that, uh, that effect lasted. Um, and, and the control group had twice as many cardiovascular events. So not, e not everybody believes in the, you know, the sort of... But uh, we, we, we need to talk about the type of fats rather than the low-fat, high-fat. So I think everybody knows now that trans fats are bad and why this government is not banning them when they've been banned in a lot of European states and parts of New York and parts of, the, of America is very concerning and I think it's probably something to do with the food industry. Consumption of only 5 grams a day, tiny, 23% increase the risk of coronary heart disease. That's on the WHO website. So... Um, and the margarine produced in the 70s, which I grew up on, was pure trans fat. Um, absolutely terrifying. Margarine these days, is, some of them still do have a bit of trans fat, but less so. Um, so do you mind saying what, what, what foods would have trans fat? Okay, um, well, still some of the margarines may have trans fat. They, sometimes you would be listed as partially hydrogenated oils. Even a lot of the sort of processed food, so processed cakes, biscuits, pastries, look on the labels, and I always absolutely, you know, kind of rave on this, you know, for the sake of all our families and children, whatever, look on labels, because we, it, it is still able to be in, but it's mostly in processed foods. They do have to label it. Yeah, they do have to. No, but it's you. But that's the thing. Hydrogenated oil. It's um, which is um, yeah. They're not all of them, but some of them. But I steer people away always from those. They don't. They the, the marketing they claims. I know, I know. But actually, um, you know, a bit of butter. I'm not going mad with butter, but. Um, Yes, because that's partly why the fats have been created like that to lengthen the shelf life. And yeah, and um, can I just ask also, as far as so talking to patients, oh, there we are. yeah, uh, is it going to be labelled as hydrogenated fat or trans fat? On the it won't be trans fat, hydrogenated, but and sometimes partially hydrogenated partially as well. Hydrogenated. Yeah, yeah. What so that's yes, slightly. yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> it should be very evil. 
Um, some of the cooking oils, again, a little bit controversial, but olive oil is still, there's a lot of debate about this, but all the research, and I really keep up to date as far as I can, still the best all round cooking oil. Saturates fatty fats are good because they're most stable at high temperature. Coconut oil is getting a lot of press. There aren't huge studies around it, but it's mostly saturated fat, but it also conta but it contains a particular type, medium chain fatty acids, which are more easily digested <coughs> and less supposedly less harmful for the body. I don't think we entirely know, but at least it's a vegetarian source of What's saturated that? fat. Yeah, rapeseed oil. Um, well, it's still got a lot of omega sixes, and it still can de can uh, deteriorate. So. Um, <coughs> olive oil is the best, and yeah. cardiologist's kitchen agree, so that's handy. Right. Um, coconut oil, I mean, yeah, it's I'm got cholesterol in it as well. Well, I, yeah, well, I've, it's, uh, it doesn't have a huge amount of cholesterol, um, and it, the, the, I think the health benefits for it um, are supposed to counteract, as far as I understand it. I mean, a little bit of cholesterol actually isn't bad, unless people have the hypercholesterolemia and then really, really have to be um, ultra careful. So just to, um, Duncan's said, yeah, give me the, so I've got to, um, this is a brief um, overview. Really important to be adding these good fats in, definitely out with the bad fats and the saturated fats mod moderation. Um, yeah. Yes, polyunsaturated. Pardon? If you should eat them, why should you not cook them? Well, because they deteriorate um, as they're being cooked and they can actually turn into trans fats when they're cooked. Yeah. But so Yes, they do. I think nearly all those oils yeah, have, right. um, yeah, but it's, I mean, out, it's lesser of two right. or several evils. Um, and the saturated fats are going to be the absolute most stable, so oh. more, less likely to turn to trans fats or go rancid or go into aldehydes when they're heated. Um, but then, you know, the tricky thing with the fats, of course, they may lead to obesity, and as we were hearing from William Baird last night, the visceral fat, that can cause inflammation. So we don't want to be saying, you know, loads of fats are, you know, good, but it's the, the health oils are actually essential for, you know, they're, and they're going to be much better for you than the refined carbohydrates. And if people haven't, I'm always saying this as a, nutrit a nutritionist, when people are having enough healthy oils, it makes them sustained for longer and they make those choices of like the refined carbohydrates and the sugars, it makes them crave a lot less. It slows down any release of your carbohydrates, so sprinkling on some, so you are sustained for longer and really, really helpful for blood sugar um, um, control. So this is the eight principles of life, not about restriction, eating good meals, don't snack, Reduce refined and non-whole grain, replace with whole grain, watch your sugar intake, could have talked a lot more about that. Cut out sweet drinks, again, not into low calorie, they trick the body and metabolism as well, and that has that can have quite catastrophic catastrophic metabolic effects too. Um, don't go low fat but favour plant and marine based unsaturated fats. Um, limit alcohol, glass of wine because of the calorie content. And again, exercise, which we haven't had time to talk much about. Michael Pollan, one of my favorite food writers, he's American, but he has some great one-liners. <laughs> this is great. If it came from a plant, eat if it was made from a plant, don't. And basically, the last one, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I don't, you know, that's, that's we could have just yeah. said that and I could have got down. So um, <laughs> that's, um, that's Thank it. You Thank, you. Thank you.